interested in flying or migrating in North and South America uh, are a very distinct group of birds and do not have a, a great deal of opportunity to, to commingle or interact with the birds that are in Asia. Canadian officials are also keeping a close eye on flights arriving from countries affected by the flu virus. Travelers are being checked and so are any products that might be infected. We are doing all we can to stop it now. By having policies in place, we do not allow live poultry, poultry products, and we're talking about feathers and material like that, to come, to come from Asia to Canada. So, steps are being taken to try to keep the virus out of Canada. But what if it does mutate into a more deadly form? What if a flu pandemic does break out? How prepared are Canadians to deal with what might happen? How will we cope with a situation where there might not be enough health workers to treat the sick and the dying? Not enough hospital beds. Not enough workers to keep businesses going. Not enough police officers to keep law and order. The CBC's Joan Leishman looks at what might happen in Canada and what might not. Whenever the pandemic does strike, a lot of this will stop, ravaging parts of the country, making Toronto's SARS outbreak two years ago seem trivial. Ottawa's grim forecast, 30 to 40 percent of all Canadians will be infected. Up to 138,000 will be hospitalized. As many as 58,000 will die. Ice rinks will be needed as temporary morgues. After the SARS outbreak, a national plan was devised to prepare for and respond to a pandemic. Canada's chief public health officer is working with the provinces, territories and municipalities to be ready for the emergency whenever it hits. Dr. David Butler-Jones. While obviously the avian flu is, is worrisome, um, in reality it could be two years, ten years or even twenty years before we say, see in fact the next pandemic of influenza. So these plans need to be continually developed, revised. My hope is that we will have more time so we can continue to build our capacity uh, but even if we were to face it tomorrow we're in a better position than we were a year or two years ago. A cornerstone of the strategy is a vaccine. It'll take several months to develop one after a pandemic breaks out. However, 60 million doses are to be made by a Canadian company, more than enough for everyone in the country. Those who become infected before a vaccine is ready will be treated with the antiviral drug Tamiflu. 20 million doses of it have already been stockpiled. We're continuing to review what level of stockpile we need in Canada. The focus of that will be on uh, primarily for treatment of those most likely to uh, get serious illness or die, as well as uh, sort of key, key people in terms of maintaining the, the, maintaining the system. The pandemic plan is a really good start, okay, and Canada is well ahead of many other countries in terms of pandemic planning. Infectious disease expert and SARS survivor Dr. Allison McGeer of Toronto's Mount Sinai Hospital applauds our national plan but quickly adds it's far from complete. The piece that's not done yet is the translation of the national plan through to what's actually going to happen at a community level in the individual hospital level in a physician's office. A maze of logistical questions worries Dr. McGeer. Who's going to distribute the vaccine? Where and how? And there are ethical questions. Who's going to get the antiviral drugs first? A nurse, but not her children? And what happens when everything is swamped? Okay, we've used up every bed in the system, we've used up all the critical care beds, we've used up all the ventilators. Where do we go from here? And that second phase of planning really hasn't started yet. Still, it isn't only the health system that's getting ready. The financial sector is also starting to plan on how to buttress against a pandemic. Some economists are predicting that borders will close, trade and travel dry up, billions of dollars will be lost. If this happens, we will see people, we'll know a lot of people that are sick. Sherry Cooper, Executive Vice President of the BMO Nesbitt Burns Financial Group, has written two reports urging businesses to come up with contingency plans. Businesses have to be able to operate 
assuming about a 35% absentee rate. Sherry Cooper has already stockpiled masks for her team. Businesses and others, she says, are going to have to protect their own workers. I think people will feel the safest in their homes, so it's important to make sure that, that individuals in their homes have broadband, internet access, have the appropriate computers, or have access to whatever data or files that they need, and that they're connected to the networks of their companies. Experts say don't panic, prepare. Work at staying healthy, wash your hands, and get a flu shot because it may provide some protection against whatever strain of influenza does erupt into a pandemic. Joan Leishman, CBC News, Toronto. So Canada is preparing for a pandemic, but a lot remains to be done. And in many other countries, the situation is even more critical. Two years ago, the World Health Organization asked all the countries in the world to come up with contingency plans for a pandemic. So far, it says only about 40 have done so. And that's News in Review. I'm Carla Robinson. Thanks for watching. catastrophe as AIDS claims more and more victims. People continue to get infected. There is no reason of using a condom. Once I am HIV, I am, I am dying. Today on News and Review, AIDS in Africa, despair and denial. Hello, I'm Carla Robinson. At the end of 2005, the United Nations released its annual report on the global HIV AIDS epidemic. And it was both encouraging and deeply depressing. Encouraging because more money than ever before is being poured into the war against HIV AIDS and more people in poor countries are receiving life-saving drugs. Depressing because not nearly enough is being done to treat all the people who desperately need help. Millions are still dying, and millions of others continue to get infected. Nowhere is the situation as bad as in the countries of sub-Saharan Africa. 60% of the 40.3 million people living with HIV in the world live there. In 2005, almost 2.5 million adults and children died there of AIDS, and more than 3 million others were infected. To find out more about the devastating impact of Africa's AIDS crisis, journalist Soraya Samura traveled to Zambia and discovered some terrible truths about an epidemic that is killing a continent. Here are some scenes from his documentary, Living with AIDS. This is Zambia. AIDS kills over 240 people here per day, and most Zambians can't expect to live past their mid-30s. I've come to the town of Mongu in the Western province to live and work for one month in a hospital at the front line of the AIDS epidemic. I want to find out why AIDS is destroying this continent and what responsibility we Africans have in stopping this disease. Lewanika Hospital in Mongu serves a population of 200,000. With 273 beds, it's the largest hospital in the region. I'm going to be working here as a ward orderly. I'm assisting nurse Betty Mubita, who's been working here for nine months. She tells me her ward is often overrun with patients. The, the normal capacity of bed is supposed to be because here it's 20 beds, there it's 18 beds. So, so it's yeah, there's 38 beds. There are 58 people. Yes, at one go. yes. So the rest will just lie on the floor. On the floor, and uh, uh, even the nursing care, sometimes you are just alone on duty. My job as a ward orderly will mean helping the nursing staff, washing and feeding the patients, and cleaning the wards.
There's rarely more than four nurses on the ward, and it's already clear to me that this place is under enormous pressure. Most of these patients are in the last stages of AIDS and need help with the most basic tasks. Some lucky patients have relatives who are allowed to stick around to help. Even washing my hands is a challenge. What? There's no water. This is gone. It's gone. Wow. I thought, I mean, even water is now a problem. Jesus. I can't believe this. Because just now we had water there. Yes. In a few minutes' time, the water is gone. Jesus. So even the, the water. The next morning, I go with Betty to collect drugs for the patients on the male ward. The pharmacy is down to its last few boxes of life-saving antiretroviral drugs. ARVs, as they are known, suppress the HIV virus, boosting the immune system. But they are too expensive for most Zambians. These ARVs will be distributed in a week's time on a first-come, first-served basis. But I found the other drugs in this hospital in short supply. Hydrocortisone injection, yeah. we don't have. That's out, out of, of stock. stock. Yeah. Then kefatoxin injection, we also don't have. Out of stock. Yes. Chloramphenicol injection, we have. We're going to give you 50 vials. Instead of 100, OK. Yeah. And surgical gloves, we don't have. Goals, we don't have. Well, I don't know from my perspective, Betty, this is looking good. What do you, what do you think? What do you feel about this oh, order? We're supposed to be equipped, but since we are not equipped and um, uh, the disease is on, uh, like, it's, 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 it's only increase, that means we're not doing anything. That means even if you wanted to, we are not acting aggressively against the, the, the disease. So if, if this will continue, then... You, we will be losing, we are fighting a losing battle, if this is what you continue. This afternoon, my job is to clean the mortuary before the relatives come to collect their dead. The mortuary doubles as a funeral parlor, as one family washes their loved one, another family are waiting to take their turn. Most local people here with AIDS never make it to the hospital. They die at home. It's my second week and I'm moving in with the Kasanga family to find out how they cope with the disease. Good. So this is the, All right, the okay. home. This is the Felix. Felix. Uh, this it's pleased to meet you, Felix. Uh, you want? Uh, pleased to meet you, Harry. Born daughter. So this is, this is my room. Yes, this is going to be your, your place. Mm. Perfect. The Kasangas are a large family headed by 56-year-old Felix and 46-year-old Irene. Both have AIDS. Felix suffers from TB, a heart condition, and can hardly walk. Irene has to provide for her husband four children and six grandchildren. It's a family in crisis. I'm worried and uh, considering now the 
the situation which is happening, if you are Felix will just be left alone. And since as we have noticed, I don't move, I have to be there. Who will look after you if you also go down now? That's why uh, last night Felix was weeping uh, that if I, I become very sick, then he will die. Uh, and I, I, I don't know. Now, he, the one who was uh, advising me to be strong and make sure that I also get my medication. The church has an influential role to play in the prevention of AIDS in Africa. I wish to greet you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The pastor stresses abstinence, but his stance on contraception seems dangerously naive. HIV is one of the uncurable diseases. The Lord wants us to talk about it in the church today. Me, I don't support the issue of condoms because that has been made by man. Man shall not protect this. And so it is only God. So the only, the only protection measure, according to the Bible, is to stick to Jesus. I cannot believe that in this continent, in this day and age, in the middle of this epidemic, anyone would advise merely abstinence as credible solution. That night, back in Mongo, abstinence is definitely not on the agenda. This is where most of the young adults seem to come to drown their sorrow. These people seem intent on getting completely drunk. It feels like the whole village is here. Even the little girls are imitating the suggestive dancing of their older sisters. All right. I wanted to find out about the sexual attitudes around here. I managed to corner a couple of young guys. Myself, when I finish drinking, I just go for any girl and have sex with her. Direct, I don't use a condom because I enjoy. Because I used when I was young. Be direct, not even putting a condom. I don't worry. So you do flesh to flesh? I do flesh to flesh. That's why I believe. Yeah, Even if you do, why not use a condom? Yeah, because myself, I'm not, I'm HIV positive. So why there is not no use a condom? There is no reason of using a condom. Once I am HIV, I am, I am dying. Mm -hmm. So you would prefer to take more people with you? That's the thing. It's my last week in Zambia, living with a family who are affected by AIDS. Irene's health is deteriorating. The Kasangas need her to stay well, as she is the sole breadwinner for a family of 11. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Felix and Irene have finally decided to tell their two teenage daughters, Nyama and Bartha, that they have AIDS. HIV. The news prompts Nyama and Bartha to be tested for HIV. Ah. Last time. Mm -hmm. 
It's a cruel blow for Irene and her family, who already have so much to cope with. After my shift at the hospital, I get back to the village to find Felix has got worse. He's taken his ARVs, but he can't keep them down. If Felix cannot eat, the drugs are less effective. To stay healthy, he needs proper nutrition along with the ARVs. Throughout the night, Felix suffers terrible bouts of diarrhea. The pressure on Irene is just too much. The problem is I'm very worried with the diarrhea because uh, he has lost uh, weight. Me, I wait tomorrow. Felix Kasanga died one week later. He was 56 years old. At a recent AIDS conference in Africa, delegates warned of a social catastrophe if more is not done to bring the continent's AIDS crisis under control and more life-saving drugs are not provided to the millions of Africans living with HIV who desperately need them but can't afford them. And that's News in Review. I'm Carla Robinson. Thanks for watching. Toronto deals with a frightening increase in gun violence. Something's coming wrong with this world, honestly. The, this isn't right. This is for the three of you. And tries new ways to help young people stay out of trouble. Today on News and Review, Guns and Gangs, Toronto Fights Back. Hello, I'm Carla Robinson. 2005 was a bloody year in Canada's biggest city. Toronto was shaken by a wave of gang violence and a record number of deaths by gunfire. Almost twice as many as the year before, the most shocking incident took place on Boxing Day when gunmen sprayed a crowded street with bullets. It happened here in one of Toronto's busiest shopping districts. Police say two groups of young people started arguing and then opened fire on each other. Seven people were shot, one of them, a 15-year-old girl, Jane Kriba, out shopping with her family, was hit in the head and died. Dave Pakasak was working in a store nearby. I just, I just came and I saw a girl lying on the... She was uh, bloody on the ground. I heard, like, really, really loud bang. Bang, 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 like 10, 10, 10 to 12 shots. Another man was critically injured. Two suspects were later arrested, and at least one handgun was recovered. The shootout came about a month after another killing shocked the city. The murder of an 18-year-old gunned down outside the funeral of another young shooting victim. The CBC's Ron Charles reports. It started as a somber event at this North Toronto church for a 17-year-old who had died a violent death. Jamal Michael Hemmings was gunned down on a North Toronto street last week. At his funeral today, more shooting, more death. An 18-year-old friend of Hemmings was shot and killed right outside the church. The whole community should be outraged that, that, that uh, the level of violence that is taking place uh, in the city uh, and, and the guns that are out there and the, and, and the shootings that are taking place, it's outrageous. Police locked down three schools in the area for several hours as they began a manhunt for three suspects who got away in a car. People here are appalled. Something's coming wrong with this world, honestly. The, this isn't right. People are killing each other at funerals when they should be mourning or celebrating their life. That's just wrong. Still, the neighborhood is no stranger to gun violence. Three weeks ago, right? This side and the other side, two people were shot. So they have to do something about it. Over the past year, Toronto has seen an unprecedented amount of gun violence, but nothing like this, a shooting at a church in broad daylight in front of hundreds of mourners. 
but we have to do more. So brazen, so shocking that Toronto's mayor and its police chief held a joint news conference, blaming this latest shooting, like so many others, on gangs and drugs. As, I, as I've witnessed some of the violence perpetuated by these individuals over the course of this summer, I'm finding myself less and less surprised at, at the...